Hey, welcome to the Road and Morale podcast. So do you ever feel like screaming out in the office on Zoom or outside the school gates? For the love of God, come on, really? Then if this is you and you're looking for an honest, fun and frank podcast on life and business, then sit back and listen to me, Rona Morel. I'll be bringing great people on the show to talk, share and debate their life experiences and business challenges. Keeping the show unpolished, but in a fun and unique British style, with sarcasm, tenacity, maybe a few swear words or tears. This podcast keeps it real, honest, raw and removes the bullshit in the only way I know how, through authenticity and getting shit done. Think of it less like the Housewives of New York or TOWIE with the lipo and drama and more like the house lives of the real world. I hope you'll take something away to be better informed laugh, smile, or maybe even finally get in the confidence to shout, come on, really. So enjoy. Hi, Judith Curry. Welcome to the Rain Morale podcast. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me, Rana. Oh, you are most welcome. So for the listeners, I'm delighted to have um, Judy on the show today. And there's a real reason why I've brought Judy on today. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about... Judy, now I'm actually going to read off your bio because I don't want to miss anything out and you've got a pretty impressive background. So um, Dr. Judith Curry actually is the president and co-founder of Climate Forecast Applications Network, or CFAN for short, we do love an acronym, um, a professor emirati at the Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, where you served as chair of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences for 13 years. Um, Your expertise is in climate dynamics, extreme weather and prediction predictability around those um, topics. You're also currently a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and various other um, unions and and levels that go way beyond my brain or capacity (laughs) in terms of influence and, 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 and circles of influence. Now, you've had a really influential um, career in academic research and administration, and you basically founded CFAN to translate kind of cutting edge weather and climate research into products and services and how we can how the the world can can use those, I I guess, against various different industries. Um, You have certainly been a global thinker on climate change and been brought into US congressional um, testimonies. The one thing that caught my eye and one of the things why we're talking is the book that you wrote around climate uncertainty and risk. And that leads really nicely into what I want to talk to you about today. Um, the book really was about rethinking the climate change problem. It's a huge narrative, isn't it? And we talk climate change and there's just a bucket of everything underneath it. Um, And I know you've spoken a lot on uh, the CO2, could be seen as climate alarmism. Some people might say and think that um, some of the works and things that you talk about is about denying it. Um, And I'd love to just dive into all of that, if that's okay, Judy. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you. Oh, excellent. No, I'm really excited for this. So I guess let's get the kind of the CO2 bit out of the way. So not out of the way because it's quite important, but essentially for someone like me who's come from a corporate world, I made a conscious shift to to kind of come into this space and I've tried to understand Um, weather patterns and when I was a a little girl I genuinely thought that the world would just change because the planet evolves and in my naivety I guess as I got older and learned about our planet's frozen over millennia and it's heated over millennia in a way I suppose I was right our planet evolves into these captions and when we look at temperatures on our planet right now we are looking at a nanosecond, aren't we, in time, essentially, versus how long we've been here. So I was always aware of that, but we then talk a lot about CO2 and carbon emissions. Please help me understand from a research uh, and academic point of view, where you think we might be getting the narrative wrong around the impacts of human CO2. Okay, <clears throat> when you explained your early understanding of climate and everything, well, you mostly had it right, <laughs> okay? Um, 
humans emit carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has an infrared emission spectra that helps keep the planet warm. This is a so-called greenhouse effect. Since about 1860, global temperatures have overall been warming. These are three things that are undisputed. However, those three points, either individually or in combination, tell us nothing about whether CO2 has dominated over natural variability, okay, over the last century. It doesn't determine how the climate is going to play out in the 21st century, other than in a minor way. And there's no prima facie reason to think that warming is dangerous. So, um, you know, once you get past the basics that nobody disagrees about, that we are putting CO2 in the atmosphere and it is warming us a bit, we don't know how much warming. Even the UN climate assessment reports give it a factor of three uncertainty in terms of how much warming from a doubling of carbon dioxide, okay? And the climate models neglect to, well, they don't, we don't know how to predict how many volcanic eruptions we're gonna have or what the sun is gonna do or how the large scale ocean circulations are gonna play out. We don't know how that's gonna play out in the 21st century. So overall from CO2, we would expect a slow creep of warming. Um, that, you know, shouldn't be all that much, nothing we can't adapt to. But the reason we're all scared about it is is they've tied every bad weather event, you know, every heat wave, hurricane, flood, whatever, to CO2 emissions. I mean, we have always had bad weather and climate events. We're having them now. We'll have them in the future, independently of what we do with carbon dioxide. Even the UN climate assessment reports find very little um, in the way of extreme weather events to link to the global warming other than heat waves. Um, Everything else, you know, there's no particular relation. Of course, I've studied the US the most, but the weather, in the 1930s was far and away the worst in the US. The worst heat waves, the worst droughts, the worst wildfires, and even the worst landfalling hurricanes. And this was, you know, at a temperature that was, you know, almost a degree cooler than what we have now. So there's no particular relationship between extreme weather and climate events and the warming. Mm. And, you know, if anything is really bad going to happen from the slow creep of global warming it might be in the 23rd century <laughs> you know and you know right. it's not you know the the urgency that we're told you know cold red existential threat and that we have to do this now uh, i mean th- there's really no no big harm nothing that we can adapt to in the 21st century I mean, something bad could happen to the weather and climate of the 21st century, but it's more likely to be caused by natural climate variability or a series of explosive volcanic eruptions, something like that, you know, than it would be from the slow creep of warming. So, I mean, it's an issue. We don't endlessly want to be dumping stuff into the air, but it's not an existential threat. And the worst part about this is that we've coupled the energy system to the climate change problem. I mean, of course, everybody wants more abundant, less expensive, cleaner um, energy than what we have now. And as we evolve and make progress in the 21st century, you know, we should rethink you know, our energy infrastructure and try to do things better and cheaper. We're eventually going to run out of fossil fuels. um, And, you know, oil is sufficiently valuable. We're probably not going to want to burn it, (laughs) you know, around 2100. So of course we're going to transition, but the issue with climate change is we have to do it now. And we have to use the doing technologies that we can easily put in place like wind and solar. (laughs) 
<laughs> you can't you can't run you know a 21st century industrial economies on wind and solar and particularly in Europe i mean they have a huge land footprint i mean transmission lines wind and solar power plants and then the offshore i mean you don't have that kind of space canada the us and the australia you know we have enough space to do it if we wanted to but europe and you know, Japan and countries like that, and Korea, they, they there's no way that they have the land space that they would want to devote to wind, solar, and transmission lines. So it's a solution that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, the one good thing coming out of the UN meetings this week in Dubai is that all of a sudden they've decided that nuclear power is okay. You know, there's been a you know, since about the 1980s, there's been a fatwa against nuclear power led by Greenpeace. Um, and, you know, it's far and away the cleanest, um, cheapest, safest power supply that we have right now. Um, and, you know, the new technologies where you actually reuse the fuel so you don't have a big waste disposal problem. And, it's not that hard. Finland has solved the waste disposal. They bury it deep underground in these big cement casks. You know, it's not, it's, you know, it's not that big of an engineering challenge to dispose of the waste, but to the extent that you can reuse it, then it's not a problem at all. So by coupling the energy and the climate problem, we're making, and by all this propaganda about the climate change problem is urgent and catastrophic and existential threat and all this stuff that we hear, um, you know, we, it's <clears throat> led us to making really bad decisions about our energy infrastructure. And once we mess up our energy infrastructure and make it more expensive, we're gonna be more vulnerable to extreme weather and climate events. I mean, in, in yeah, I mean, energy is how we protect our energy and wealth is how we protect ourselves from the environment and extreme weather. Yeah, so that, I just wanted to kind of touch on that, I guess, to ask those those questions. It's like, there's two ways of looking at it. Like you say, there's not enough resources, like you say, to keep doing fossil fuel and oil. So let's, let's say we fast forward 100 years or 200 years or however many, and it's all gone. We're going to have to transition to something, right? <laughs> we, we have to replace it with something. And I get the arguments around small landlock. I mean, obviously, I live on a relatively small island and, you know, we've got 68 million people on here. And already when wind farms go up, there's huge protests, not in my back garden. We don't want them in the oceans. There's an awful lot to go at. But eventually, at some point, what's your view on we can't keep doing what we're doing and how how much wider in your circle of influence do you look at things like extraction of raw materials poverty inequality um and and surely there's been an increase in extreme weather conditions because that's certainly what we're hearing that well, there has been you know <laughs> that's the whole issue the, the 21st century has been relatively benign um and, and i have a number of examples in my book Okay, half of the world's population lives in the monsoon region of Asia, okay? And they rely on those rains. And for the last 100 years of monsoon, I mean, you know, you have big, big monsoon and, you know, weak monsoon years, but it's still around a relatively small range. If you go back to the 1800s, I mean, there were, there was, a decade long monsoon failure in the 1800s had nothing to do with burning fossil fuels. So natural uh, variability can produce far bigger insults yeah. um, than the slow creep of global warming. Another example that I used in my book was the big atmospheric rivers that produce a lot of rainfall. Um, yeah. You get them in Europe, and, and it's a really big deal in the Western U.S. And last year we had a, some really heavy ones and a sequence of them, but it was, oh my gosh, crazy, crazy. Must be global warming. Well, the winter of 1861 to 1862, 
all of Central California was 10 feet underwater, okay, for a period of months from these atmospheric rivers. So it was much worse back then. Okay, so so thinking that our weather is bad, yeah, it you just have to look at the historical data and you know, there, there is a lot of natural climate variability yeah. and there are, are just random bad weather events and superimposed on that is a slow creep of warming. Um, you know, in geologic, you know, in human history and geologic history, they refer to the warm period as the optimum. <laughs> okay. Because the, the I... warm period is when people and ecosystems thrived and now all of a sudden we're talking about a slow warming and yeah. we're all in a bad panic over it um i mean it's just doesn't make sense we're you know how we came to the position where we think that we can prevent bad weather by stop burning fossil fuels is really pretty insane and that's the bit that i really want to like I guess it's it's a challenge for me, if I'm being absolutely honest. I look at my LinkedIn feed, and of course, naturally, I'm connected to just so many people in the kind of, not just energy or CO2, but certainly within sustainable development goals. And, that, and obviously, that covers like a huge range. But it's all I ever hear and see on the news. It's this weather and that climate. And what what sort of, have you done any studies in terms of what you've done about how ocean acidification and ocean warming and how that impacts, you know, I, I've kind of been reading around, you know, the runoff of toxins and plastic and waste into the oceans and how that's warming the oceans. And then that has an impact on the atmosphere and et cetera. You know, is that the sort of thing that you've also looked at? Oh yeah. Um, you know, the ocean acidification is, is really I mean, we're changing the pH by a tiny bit, but the natural spatial variability of pH in the ocean is huge. And, you know, they do laboratory studies and say, well, if it gets too acidic, then the shells on these animals and whatever, and their bone structure is going to be bad. But when they study populations of fishes, fishes and ocean animals, they see no effect of the increasing acidity. I mean, they just move around to where they want to be and they... If some place has a you know a higher acidity, then they'll just move somewhere else. So, so the study, our understanding of that is in its infancy, but I see nothing at this point to worry about because the ecosystems in the ocean don't seem to be impacted by the level of you know acidification that we're talking about. So that's not to worry. I mean, plastics polluting the ocean, the overfishing, of course. I mean, right. those are things that we should try to control, but it has absolutely nothing to do with CO2 in the atmosphere. It's, it's a separate problem. And they try to link all these, every problem that we have and call it climate change and blame it on CO2 emissions. But that right. makes us avoid the real sources of the problems, okay, yeah. which have other sources. And it's often related to other, you know, real pollution, bad governance, you know, all of these other things yeah. that we should be working to take care of. But instead we say, oh, global warming, you know, there's nothing we can yeah. do than to prevent fossil fuels. And offshore wind, <laughs> you know, is maybe one of the biggest insults to ocean ecosystems that's out there. You know, coastal ecosystems are so yeah. rich in terms of life. And, and maybe in the North Sea, it's not so bad because there's possibly not so much life up there. But off the Atlantic. It's too bloody cold. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, too cold. Yeah. But off the coast, you know, the U.S. Atlantic coast is a very vibrant ecosystem. And tons of whales, dead whales are being washed up on shore. I mean, you know, the sonic, the vibrations, all this kind of stuff is just a huge insult to the coastal ecosystems. And this makes right. no sense. And the ocean environment, and it's so expensive. They're way more expensive than wind turbines on land. And they have to deal with a much harsher environment and salt and yeah. whatever. That equipment is not going to last very long. It is just beyond senseless um, offshore wind. I mean, to me, that's the absolute right. worst solution is offshore wind. 
Yeah, I've been looking at the impacts of the um, not only migrating bird routes, but also, you know, whale and other larger mammals in the ocean and how it impacts them and breeding, feeding, all of those things. Yes, the longevity, the depreciation, is it five years versus what should be 25 years? I don't know. And of course, there's then, of course, the raw materials to make solar, um, wind turbines, etc. So if we know that fossil fuels eventually whether we did nothing about it will run out right that's that's kind of going to happen we would make a trend if it weren't for the climate change issue we would be making a slow transition away from fossil fuels because we're going to get slow just just out of interest like let's pretend cop 28 1 to 28 never happened what what would be a slow transition because i mean i know that you, you obviously you work with you know, fossil fuel companies and you help them with weather and reporting and product services. So what are you saying to them about mitigation versus transition and how does that work? Well, the the first thing we should be trying to do is transition away from coal. I mean, coal in the US is really hard and relatively clean, but in Europe and especially in China, it's soft and dirty. Okay, so, I mean, we should be trying to transition away from coal. And, you know, the irony of this whole transition is that Germany was in pretty good shape 10 years ago with, you know, nuclear power and everything. And then they decided to go all wind and solar, shutting down coal power plants, um, shutting down all their nuclear power plants (laughs) and, and importing natural gas from Russia. We know how that turned out. Um, and so now they're back to they they've reactivated their coal plants, right? <laughs> okay, and their their yeah. their their electricity prices are sky high. Industry has fled, so they're producing as much CO two emissions as they were ten years ago because of all these bad decisions when they could have kept their nuclear power and built more. <laughs> okay, and that would have been like okay, a just good... to play just to play devil's advocate on that. Is it? Is it a bad decision or is it just bad timing? They just went too early in that transition. Should they have not cut everything off and just start? Because obviously for here in the UK, we only get about, I think, 5% of our gas um, from from Russia. But still, even when things happened with the war, our prices have still skyrocketed. Like, and and most of us... Yeah, there was a global, you know, shortage and there was a transition away from pipeline gas to liquefied natural gas that can be shipped around and that became very expensive. And Pakistan is is a big victim of all this because they were told, you know, don't develop your coal resources, don't do, you know, do natural gas. They don't have any local resources. So they were relying on shipped in liquefied natural gas. Now with Germany and Europe buying it, the prices are sky high and Pakistan can't afford it. So they're screwed. So, so, you know, so many, you you know, these are global commodities, you know, unless you producing coal and oil on your own land, you know, you're you're caught up in this global commodity issue. Yes, that's actually a really interesting point because whilst we might talk about (laughs) the need to bless you the need to transition over a period of time there's also that question for me around what could should the fossil fuel industries be doing should they be legislated more should they should they be um mm. spending more because all we hear is bumper profits and we've made you know 900 billion in this quarter and you kind of think to, to the layman to the everyday person it's like they're never going to do anything. They're not going to change until they have to. The irony is that we're going to need a lot more fossil fuels during the transition to build all this stuff and to transport it and and do all of this to to set up the infrastructure for a cleaner economy. So, so once we, you know, my, my take on this is that we should not be trying to kneecap the fossil fuel companies is but you know, let the market take care of it. There's a, you know, a global priority to transition to cleaner fuels, 
nuclear, whether it's geothermal possibly in some locations. And I think rooftop solar is a decent solution in some locations. Um, so just let the market take care of it and evolve. At some point, gas and oil and whatever is going to become more expensive. And, you know, the, the best arguments against coal, and this is the big driver for China originally to, to do this was, I mean, if you've ever been to Beijing in the wintertime, I mean, it is, oh my gosh, the pollution is horrible. Yeah. They have temperature inversion, it's cold, and all of that pollution is just trapped and it's absolutely horrible. It's like being in the worst forest fire out in California. It's yeah. horrible. And so the people don't like that and they want cleaner air. So, so that's the biggest driver for getting away from coal. And coal is genuinely yeah. polluted. I lived in the Southeast US, you, you know, which used a lot of coal and there's fly ash and, and, and the, you know, mountaintop removal and yeah. it just the environment you know so so it's not good for the environment so transitioning away from coal makes a whole lot of sense unless you have local coal resources you know and you're not wealthy and you want to use your local resources yeah. people should be able to allow be allowed to do that but like for a country like germany relying on coal or the uk you know that doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense for the long term um so, I mean, it's, so uh, the, if it weren't for this, we would be transitioning. And if it weren't for all the green piece and this whole, I don't know why the push for wind and solar, why people think, why anyone thought that was going to work. I mean, I think nuclear is a great solution and <clears throat> advanced geothermal technologies are coming online. That looks very promising yeah. to me. Um, you know, this is where, you know, if I was an investor, this is where I didn't be investing. And smart microgrids and, you know, getting away from these big, you know, more local production of your energy with smart microgrids. Um, yeah. But to me, this is what I see at the end of the 21st century. It'll be a lot of nuclear geothermal where you have it rooftop solar, smart microgrids, you know, this is what yeah. I think will eventually evolve to. I don't think the wind and solar craze will serve, or, or the, the wind craze will survive beyond the current generation of turbines. I mean, the wind turbines, yeah. you know, the infra huge, you know, when you drive by there and you look up at them, you don't realize how huge yeah. they are. But if you've ever been driven on a, a highway where you see these huge long trucks with a single wind turbine. Yeah. You get a sense of how enormous these things are. And, yeah. and and the killer is after about 10 years, these wind turbines start producing, they degrade, they start producing yeah. less electricity. And they should be, you know, even oh well, the lifetime is 25 years. Well, you really need to replace the blades every 10 nice. to 15 years. If you're going yeah. to keep up maximum uh, wind power production. So it's just, you know, in a, it, it may be a niche solution in a few locations, like in northern Texas in the U.S., where there's nothing else there. And they it seems very to windy. Work. Yeah, it's very windy. And it's, you know, maybe 20 to 30 percent of their power infrastructure you know, their power generation, you know, and, and it seems to yeah. be sort of working, but taking it much more than, than 30% um, really messes up your yes. power system. And it requires a huge amount of land use that most places don't have. And it makes everything so complicated and more expensive because you have to add all these things to the transmission grid um, to deal with the asynchronicity and you have to have backup power systems or huge um, storage yeah. facilities or something. And all this gets very, very expensive. I mean, it's just not, you know, yeah. if it wasn't for all the subsidies that governments are putting into this, it's not really competitive. Um, well, and I think, I mean, certainly from a UK point of view, there's in comparison, the subsidies to fossil fuels versus say green, 
I mean, you're talking elite versus me sat here in my little house. So, I mean, there's there's obviously unfair comparisons in terms of the amounts and substances, but you you touched there a little bit about um, places like Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa. Do you think they should be able to to tap into their natural resources? Because we know it's okay, say, in nuclear, but unless you've got a spare you know, 50 million to, you know, a couple of hundred million dollars, why wouldn't you use something that's already in the ground? And let's be honest, people have made billions from it because you haven't got to pay for it in the first place, apart from the structure and the setup. Do you think they should be allowed and actually other areas should transition? I support it 1000%. If you look at the UN sustainability goals, you can argue about them, but, you know, first is alleviate poverty. Second is alleviate hunger. Then you need, you know, adequate energy, you know, electricity and ability to industrialize. If you don't allow them energy, they can't do any of that. Okay. And, And the hypocrisy of, you know, well, it's okay for, you know, North America and Europe and, Australia and Japan, but we're not going to allow you people to develop even to one tenth, you know, of what we're doing in North America and Europe. I mean, and that is just, you know, green colonialism, energy apartheid, whatever you want to call it is absolutely evil. Africa has a ton of coal and oil resources. And they don't really have the money to develop them for their own use. But, you know, European and North American oil companies come in and take their resources and then send all the send yeah. all the oil and everything to Europe and Asia. I mean, how evil is that? I mean, to me, that's absolutely evil. You know, we should just let them let them develop their own fossil fuel resources and yeah. we should actually help them. And the, the more that they can get developed, the more they can you know, it, it's the, the, in Europe and North America, relatively wealthy, we have the luxury of worrying yeah. about great stuff. Okay. When people are, you know, don't have any machines at all to do their farming, you know, they're doing it by hand and they're victims of every, you know, bad weather event. Um, you know, yeah. the, the, the farthest thing from their mind, you know, they want to develop. Um, and if, if you allow them and help them, they can't get loans, you know, from the European banks or the, you know, the development yeah. banks because, oh, you know, they think it's virtuous not to fund any more fossil fuel power yeah. plants. Well, it, they have to. I mean, part of the transition is to bring particularly Africa up to speed with some sort of um electricity and energy infrastructure so they can develop. There's a lot of intelligent, good people there who can take it and run with it, you know, once they have this backbone of energy so they can develop the country. You know, they don't need the grand poobahs from the UN or the World Bank coming in to tell them what they do. They just need somebody to make them a reasonable loan so they can develop their resources, their own fossil fuel and I guess a loan that isn't then precipitate, you know, with re- really rubbish terms, you know, unfair terms in terms of payment or how it should do. I mean, what do you what do you say to people, though, that say, OK, well, why don't we just let them get this energy infrastructure in a way that doesn't repeat what we've done, that is less extractive? We do these mini, you know, solar grids, you know, we take and we look rooftops. Wind and solar do not work without a backup of natural gas or coal, natural gas is better. They don't work. It's intermittent. Yeah, sure, they have um, rooftop solar and occasional wind, but that is no way, you can't develop an industrial economy on that kind of energy. Okay, if you want to build nuclear power plants for them, great, go ahead, go for it. (laughs) Okay, but absent that, I mean, let them develop their own um, oil and coal resources. Um, And once they, you know, develop some wealth, then they'll start to care more about the environment and they'll start looking at nuclear. Um, I'm not sure what the, I I imagine there's pretty good geothermal resources in Africa. 
you know, helping them develop that would be good. But wind and solar are not an answer um, for a company that does not have any pre-existing yeah. infrastructure. It's hugely expensive getting in all those transmission lines and battery storage and backup this and that. I mean, it's yeah. just not going to work. Yeah, no, and I, I guess when you, you know, you touched on a minute ago about the goals about inequality, poverty, and we all know, you know, again, I'm I'm sat here privileged to know that without the Industrial Revolution, I wouldn't be sitting like most people are here. You know, my father was a coal miner, worked in the pits, um, and I remember the years of the strikes and and all of those things. So I'm not naive enough to think that everything even in this office is essentially got plastic or fossil fuels or oils and things in it, right? I guess what I'm always battling with, GD, is but we can't, as a world and as a planet, we can't keep doing what we're doing, right? Because it just doesn't feel like, feels like half of the world is still in a shit ton of poverty, excuse me for swearing, and they don't seem to have seen any benefits, of, of anything really you know people living you know under four billion living under five dollars and that's being polite a day probably two dollars fifty and then you've got the other side of things where you've got obesity drugs alcoholism depression anxiety working every hour god sends and and i'm just i'm just wondering like at what point if it's not you know, this whole fossil fuel climate change just stop oil What's your view? I'll get to my question in a minute. Sorry. What's your view on what are the major things we need to just stop doing to allow the planet? Because the planet's not in a good state. Would you agree with that? I think the planet's doing fine. I I think we need to take care of real pollution. I mean, plastic, water, um, air pollution. I mean, and we need to work with our ecosystems. I mean, we've got 8 billion people on the planet. Of course, we're going to have a footprint, but, you know, we need to manage our ecosystem, you know, our land use, you know, allow open spaces for ecosystems, you know, and, you know, population density, you know, helps allow this. I mean, the earth could support a lot more people, um, but the issue is we have to, I mean, to me, pollution I'm an old fashioned environmentalist. I worry about pollution and ecosystems, not about CO2. Um, You know, so I think the planet isn't in bad shape at all. If we have enough wealth, we can engineer. I mean, look at what the Dutch have done. Right now, their politics is for the last whatever many years have been pretty crazy, but they've engineered every inch of that little tiny country to protect it, you know, from sea level rise and storm surges. And they grow, I mean, it's a tiny country and they feed all of Europe you know, with their agriculture. So they've done amazing things. I mean, that's an example of how your land can be managed um, and engineered to support you, but it requires wealth and you're not yeah. going to get without energy. So, I mean, the wealthier, the wealthier countries are, I mean, if you go to India, it's it's yeah. just a polluted, you know, it, it's a mid-level. I mean, they've got. They have got very rich, um, yeah, vibrant yeah, they areas. Have money. They have money. Um, but the, the, the air pollution is horrible and it's just dirty in the water. It's just so polluted. I mean, this is where China was, like maybe. 15, 20 years ago, China's cleaner than it was. Okay, because people started to care. You know, we now have enough money. Ooh, we don't like, you know, this bad air quality. And they've kept certain provinces, like where Yellow Mountain is absolutely pristine. There are parts of China that are unbelievably pristine. You go to Beijing, that's another story. But, you know, then you start to care about the environment. So I think India is maybe, you know, 10 or 20 years behind China. Right. But China is going in the right direction in terms of trying to clean up its environment, yeah. you know, make sensible decisions. But um, India, you know, we need more and more yeah. energy. And we've got a lot of coal and we're going to burn it. That's where yeah. they're at right now. You know, China was there 20 years ago. So you have to go through these kind of stages. Um, you know, can you help bypass that <laughs> well, for countries of, you know, a billion people, you know, they're just going to do it. It's it, it, 
sure, you know, even in China, <laughs> control is limited as in, in spite of what Xi Jinping tries to accomplish, control is limited. Um, so you just have to go through these stages. Yeah. And, and Africa, can we be smarter about what we do, you know, with Africa? And I think letting them develop their own fossil fuel resources in the meanwhile, helping them with our engineering and, you know, eventually where they yeah. can transition to nuclear power and they may find that uh, solar power is useful to them, you know, in some locations. Um, yeah. You know, they just let them figure it out without all these, you know, all of the aid to Africa is now tied to CO2 mitigation. And, and if you have a problem, you have to claim it's caused by global warming in order to tap into loss and damage funds and everything. It's just a it's just a big sick game right now that right. is hampering development. And it's and and everything gets blamed on global warming, like the dam in Libya. Yeah. That collapse. Okay. Well, that was, you know, a heavy rainfall, no question about it. But the dam's been crumbling for decades and everybody knows it. Okay. Yeah. And this was not only was the engineering not done, but just the governance and the management. Yeah. We deal with things, you know, if something did happen to the dam. So it was bad governance, bad engineering, but they blame it on global warming. You know, the no, same and thing I, with- I, I, I do agree with that. I remember when I saw it and I saw the global warming thing and I went, no, that's just a lazy government with poor maintenance, knew it was going to crack and never did anything about it. You know, I think... One of the words you, 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 you talking earlier and you sort of said about control, I think what's interesting is we look at as we look at nations as they develop, uh, become more educated, have a better quality of life, a basis of, of thriving um, and not just surviving. There is that curve, isn't there, where they become you could become more aware. And I wonder if some people will say, well, actually, we don't want eight billion and we, we reckon we'll go to about 11 and plateau out. Um, we don't want another four billion being highly educated and knowing what's going on um you know do, do you think that's a valid kind of fear point or discussion well, okay if, if we're going to get rid of people if somebody says we want to get rid of people i said okay let's start with you and your community and your family <laughs> you know no i mean life is the primary value i mean population growth has slowed way down i don't think we're going to get to 14 billion people uh, you know i think Said about 11 now. Earth rates are dropping like crazy. Um, They're still high in Africa. And I think Pakistan is the last country in Asia where they're still insanely high. Um, But birth rates are dropping a lot. I mean, and, you know, in Japan, you know, the wealthier countries in uh, Asia, Japan, South Korea, they're way below replacement rate. And most of Europe is. Yeah, they're going the other way, aren't they? They're like huge aging uh, population. Yeah, and, and the U.S. maintains its population largely through immigration. Um, so, you know, people aren't having kids. Um, so, I, you know, I think the population, we're not going to see, I, I would be very surprised if we saw 14 yeah. billion. But the, the population growth is in the poorest countries. Okay, so it's helped them develop and they won't need to you know, yeah. read so much. The natural evolution. Bangladesh, you know, even 25 years ago, crazy population. Now they're back down to just a little bit above replacement now that they've economically developed. Um, So, you know, the the, the quickest cure for overpopulation is to allow these countries to develop economically. And empower their women, essentially, with... Uh, That's a, yes. Educating women is a big issue in terms of Huge. controlling population that that was again that's one thing that bangladesh did they really yeah you know it, women became real citizens and were educated and whatever yeah. and that you know that's a big part of why the birth rate dropped way back so i mean that this is what it ta- we know what it takes economic development it's proven. yeah so so this is what it takes yeah um, not more windmills just one last thing I want to ask you before we summarize. Um, 
because I, I guess I do struggle with this and maybe that's just because I hear and read so much but when I look at biodiversity we spoke a little bit earlier about ecosystems and the importance of kind of the ebbs and flows and, and living within them you know we have lost 69 percent of biodiversity in 70 years I mean that's a flash in you know that's me blinking my eyes that's not true <laughs> okay talk to me about that then because I, I've got people like, you know, David Attenborough, who I absolutely adore since I was a little girl. I've got various NGOs telling me that, that in 70 years, we've lost 69% of our biodiversity. We're going to have biodiversity collapses from the biggest to the smallest. If that, like, okay, why is that not true? What What is true? Stop. Okay, the inventory of species, I can't remember how, but there's an estimate I mean, how many species that we have recognized in categories and how many species that they estimate that we don't even know about that aren't categorized. It's an order of magnitude bigger. Okay, yeah. so, uh, I mean, we don't have a proper accounting of all the species on the planet. So it's fatuous to talk about that. The biggest problem is land, okay. The planet is greening right now because of additional CO2 and a little bit warmer and more precipitation. It's been greening since 1980, since we've had satellite observations. So we are greening the planet. So the vegetation part of the planet is overall doing pretty well. Um, animals rely on vegetation, you know, so this helps the animals. I mean, land use is a bigger issue. Okay, cutting down, okay, cutting down um, trees, uh, okay, for, okay, palm oil, <laughs> you know, cutting down for, you, you know, trying to, um, and, and even in England, you know, half of your agriculture, rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, and whatever gets burned as fuel. Okay, mm -hmm. a lot of your crops. I mean, this is beyond senseless. This is not the way to use the land. So if you get over this whole biofuel, agriculture for biofuels, I mean, you, you're going to save a lot of habitats. I mean, if you had natural forest in those areas, those rapeseed fields, I mean, sure, you need cooking oil or whatever, but you don't yeah. need that much. Um, most of that is going, and in the U.S., 40% of the corn crop Okay, goes to ethanol to be burned in cars and automobiles. That's a huge amount of land. Okay, that could be. And how, and how do you combine? Like, how do we combine that with, say, burning it for ethanol? So obviously, McDonald's have got their lorries that are, you know, on recycled vegetable oil. And what about land use for like beef? Because we know beef and chickens. There's just like gazillions of them, and 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 probably forty percent of crops are grown just to feed the animals. How do we balance all of that as well? Because as we develop countries around the world, they're going to want to eat more meat. Okay. There are better ways to do agriculture, you know, and, and have, there are better ways to do it. You know, regenerative agriculture, all this kind of stuff. There's better ways to do it. So, um, you know, and we need to do better on agriculture, but this whole idea of eating less meat and chicken, I mean, this is healthy food and people like it. Um, a lot of people who I'm, I'm one of them, I have celiac disease. I can't deal with grains. Okay. And pretty much all grains other than rice. Um, I have some sort of sensitivity to it. Meat is like one of the easiest things for my body to deal with. Um, so, you know, meat, I think is an important part of people's diet and people like it. Um, but we need to do agriculture better. And, you know, once we stop gr growing crops to make biofuels out of it, I mean, to me, that's a first step to try right. to sensibly redoing, you know, our agriculture, both our plants and our animals. Um, yeah, the, yeah the, there, there are better ways to do these things. And, you know, to protect the land and, you know, to, to 
our soils are, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, air pollution, water pollution, but protecting our soils and keeping them from blowing away and keeping them yeah. enriched with nutrients. I mean, that is key. That is absolutely key. 100%. The wholesale rape of the land, you yeah. know, for agriculture that then we burn for biofuels is just yeah. not. In Indonesia, guess- the palm oil situation is just horrible you know, how they've destroyed their land to, to sell some palm oil. Oh, I, yeah. And I guess, look, we'd have to have another podcast, I think, to talk about that and, you know, agrochemicals and and pharma and, and, and all of those. But I guess what we have kind of uncovered in all of this is the, A, the complexity, B, the interconnectedness. And I, it's been really good to talk through because having listened to some of the YouTubes before and having done my research on you, you know, I, I kind of came in thinking, is this somebody who just focuses very solely on the scientific side of CO2 and and climate or climate change, climate alarmism? But actually, I think what's been really nice is I've got to understand you a bit more in terms of the recognition around waste and pollution and soil degradation, regenerative agriculture, energy poverty. And yeah, there's, there's so much to, to kind of discuss. But to finish off with, with you, Judy, what are the... What are the two or three biggest things that you would like to change the narrative on? Like if you were closing COP28 now, I mean, this isn't going to come out till next year, this podcast, but whilst we're recording, we're literally on the day before um, COP28 finishes. What would be your closing statement and what would your call to action be? Well, a major theme of my book, Climate Uncertainty Risk, is the complexity of the whole thing and the interconnectedness of everything and the systemic risks surrounding, you know, what we do. You know, for, for these complex issues, the so-called cure is often a lot worse than the disease. Um, you know, we're seeing it in the climate change issue. We saw it in how we tried to control the uh, COVID pandemic. And on and on it goes. So, so once you, we need to like embrace the complexity, embrace the uncertainty, abandon the idea that we can control these things. We need to seek to better understand and figure out how to better manage these things so that we can thrive. And, and this means for all humans, you know, including the people in Africa, we need to figure out how we can support development in Africa. Overall, that's going to be good for the planet, not bad for the planet. You know, it's going to allow these people to realize the kind of prosperity and the dreams that we in the Europe and North America take for granted. And it will eventually um, be better for the environment down there. I mean, right now, you know, they're cutting down trees for fuel um, and bad for the ecosystem, bad for the pollution, on and on it goes. Um, you know, we need to be smarter and we just need to abandon the urgency of this energy transition and just do it smartly. Yeah. I mean, we, we do need to transition away from yeah. fossil fuels, but we need to be a lot smarter about it. And and particularly wind is not an answer, at least in most places. So we, we just need to abandon yeah. that and get on with figuring out how to do this better so that we're not screwing up yeah. um, the economies. And we need to reduce our vulnerability to extreme weather and climate events. They've always happened. They're happening now. They're going to happen in the future, whether it's better management of water resources, desalination plans, you know, yeah. indoor culture um what whatever it turns out to be we need to be you know for your various you know the various regions and their different vulnerabilities we need to figure that out and start focusing on that more rather than every time something bad happens global warming co2 blame everything on that when instead it's poor you know inadequate engineering uh, poor yeah. governance, bad decision making, and we need to do better on those fronts. So, so we can thrive in the 21st century, but we need to be smarter about it. And yeah. the worst thing that we could do right now is to destroy our energy infrastructure and waste all our resources on something that isn't going to work. There's lots yeah. better uses that we could be putting all that money to. 
Oh, well, listen, for anybody um, out there trying to kind of grapple with all of this, because it is very, very overwhelming, um, I think, you know, definitely go out, have a look at the book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, and start to make your own decisions. Like I've read a lot of books recently on how the world really works and bright green lies and limits to growth and degrowth and all of these things that ju just put everything on its head. So my next three coming up are our climate and the media, the energy transition, and another book that I ordered obviously when I was tired and it's all in Chinese. So I don't actually know what the book what the book's about. Um but definitely guys, the, the biggest thing I'm learning, the more of these conversations that I have with people like GD, the knowledge, the expertise, the reading it for yourself and not just taking what you see on the media or the headlines. It's really important that you do it. So I hope some people go out and buy the book, certainly, and have a read of it, Julie. And thank you so, so much for coming on. Um, I'd love to talk to you again in the future. It's been absolutely brilliant. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you, Judah. So that's it. You've made it. The show's over. Thank you for being with us. I hope you've been able to take something away, maybe solve a problem, or just know you're not alone. Here's hoping it made you smile with a few laughs along the way. Please feel free to find me on all social media channels, and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just search the Rhoda Morale podcast. Have an awesome day, and see you next time.